You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Look, if I really wanted to bum you out with climate clips to start today's episode, you know I could. Shoot, we could do that every week here at The Big Story if we wanted to, and sometimes there's no choice but to report increasingly grim news. And that can feel relentless, like we're making no progress at all. But that's just not true. You might even already know some of the big positive headlines, that electric vehicles are taking over much faster than initially predicted, that China and the United States are in a race to clean energy, changing the stakes for the rest of the world, and that investments everywhere in clean technology are surging as it becomes clear. That's where the future's going, and more importantly, that's where the money is. But I find it's the little things that can really give you hope, that can show you the progress that we're making that never really makes those big headlines, but happens every day around the world. Take coral, for instance. You've heard some bad stuff, probably, that across the world, it's vanishing. And it is. But it's likely not vanishing forever. Because we've been working for decades now to find ways to preserve coral as well as other critical parts of other ecosystems, to learn how to cultivate them, and to eventually reintroduce them to the wild. And with coral, this year, well, to put it simply, it kind of worked. I'm Jordan Heath Rawlings. This is Good News Week on The Big Story, where we give you some nice things to end your year with. Brent Foster is an independent science writer. He reported on the science of cryopreserved corals for Hakai Magazine. Hello, Brent. Hello. This is a good news week that we're trying to do here, and I know this is a good news story, but we do need to establish some context around coral reefs around the world. How dire is the situation for them? And, you know, just in general, like how fast are we losing them and why? Sure. I mean, that's an excellent question. And to be frank, the situation is pretty grim <laughs> for corals, unfortunately. So I was doing some digging, and uh, in the last 60, 70 years, we've lost about half of the corals worldwide. Um, so substantial loss there. And then even in the last decade, that's kind of accelerated a little bit more. So we've lost around 14 or 15 percent on top of that. So it's, it's not looking great. And the, the biggest reason for that is thought to be environmental stresses. So increased ocean temperatures, uh, higher ocean acidity, and this metric that maybe some people aren't as familiar with, but it's called algal overload. So, and that probably ties back to the, the increased ocean temperatures where um, basically you have these algae that are outcompeting the rest of the life in the ocean. And so all of those are, are, are providing quite a bit of stress on the corals and it's making it so that they're kind of in dire straits right now. I didn't realize that this had been going on for 60 or 70 years. I, I confess, I thought it was a pretty recent phenomenon. So, I mean, that's interesting you say that because uh, we started noticing it pretty recently, right? And, that, and then we started doing something about it recently, but it, it's kind of been an ongoing trend for quite a while now. So amid these dire straits, the reason we're talking to you is because there has been, I guess, something of a breakthrough and we'll kind of get into explaining how that happens. But first, what has uh, Ara Narita done? Sure. So Narita's group in Taiwan they're cryobiologists, so what they're doing is they're, they're taking coral larvae and they're cryopreserving or, or they're basically freezing these biological samples, storing them, and then kind of testing out different methods of, of the freezing and the thawing in an effort to preserve coral biological material. So they work with larvae. Some other groups will work with eggs and sperm. And what she's done specifically with this study that um, I reported on, she successfully froze and thawed coral larvae, and then got them to grow up to be an adult. Now, that, that's kind of a big deal because before her, the coral tend to die pretty quickly after the cryopreservation. And so um, it's not a very useful conservation tool if they don't survive. And so uh, that's why I reported on it, because it was a pretty big breakthrough in that these coral are starting to grow up. It's just one, one step closer to having a, a viable tool uh, to use. Now, the, it's interesting because they report a, a survival rate that might sound kind of low, she only got 11% of her coral to survive. And like I said, that, that sounds low, but uh, when you consider that in the wild, 
uh, only about 5% of coral larvae will grow up to be adults. It's actually really promising mm. to get that 11% in the lab after the stress of, of cryopreservation. I'm going to ask uh, what might seem a simple question, but I, I think some of our listeners maybe could use it, is just, what is a coral, really? So corals belong to a group, they're called the Cnidarians. So if you've ever seen the show Finding Nemo, you have sea anemones, right? And they're closely related to corals. And, mm. and so corals are kind of like a sea anemone that has a, a skeleton around it. So they have some soft parts, but then they have this protective skeleton that they form around themselves that offers some, some protection, it offers a home for other fish and wildlife uh, in the ocean. And they're generally colonial animals. And so you'll have different, they're called polyps. So polyps are, are basically the, the soft parts of the animal that are sticking out. They have the waving tentacles in the ocean. Right. And then they'll, they'll form this colonial group that, that basically they, they share resources amongst each other and then they'll share the skeletal structure and, and they'll form these, these really complex, beautiful structures that, that make up the coral reefs themselves. They're, they can be, they're, they're hard, they're large, they're colorful. When you think of a coral reef and, and you think of the color in the coral reef, you're probably thinking of corals. How long have we been freezing coral in an attempt to uh, figure out how to preserve them or bring them back? Like, when did, when did we start doing this? So I'm going to back up just a little bit uh, because we've been cryopreserving biological material for quite a bit now. We've only started doing it with corals in the last uh, early 2000s, so the last 20 years or so. That's right around the time when people started recognizing that, hey, there, there's this problem going on with our coral reefs. And I suspect that's probably what spawned this interest in, in trying to cryopreserve them. How do you, and I, I know this is probably a super complicated answer that I'm asking you to simplify, but, you know, can you explain the process of, of freezing and thawing and why I guess it's been so difficult that this constitutes a breakthrough? Like, what have we been trying to do with the, these coral? Sure. So the first part of that question, right, the, the process itself, uh, it can vary. There, there are lots of different ways. So I'll, I'll describe what was described in this, this paper that came out. If you had to divide it, in, there's kind of three basic steps. Essentially, you have a, a preparation step, the actual freezing step, and the thawing step. But before I get into those steps, I guess the, the whole idea with developing these protocols, when you freeze a biological sample, right, the ice that, that's contained in that sample, and, and we're, you know, most, most animals today are made up of quite a bit of water, that water will freeze. And when it freezes, it forms these crystals, and crystals are sharp. And cells don't like sharp things because it'll poke through the membranes and it'll make all of their contents inside ooze out. Mm. Um, it's, it's a big stressor. It can kill the cells. And so the idea with developing these protocols is to minimize the formation of those ice crystals in a way that the animal survives the freezing and thawing. Otherwise, it's not very useful. I talked about those three steps. You have the, the preparation step, which is basically to replace all of the water inside of the cell with an antifreeze. The, the cryobiologist might call it like a, a cryoprotectant, um, literally something that protects against freezing, so antifreeze. Mm. And that can actually be quite toxic to the cells. So there's, there's this troubleshooting step of trying to figure out, you know, how can I minimize the toxicity of this antifreeze while maximizing the, the protection? Uh, that it offers against ice crystals. Right. So that's the first step. Basically, what Narita did, she she washed her, her coral larvae into this antifreeze. And then, then you have the freezing step where you take the coral and then you, you dip it into liquid nitrogen. And what that does is it, it pretty much freezes the animal almost instantly. It's the same sort of thing that you might see in restaurants when they you know make their own ice cream or something like that. Right, right. And then you have the thawing step, which can happen a couple of different ways. Uh, if you don't have a lot of money, some groups would uh, actually bathe their samples in like this warm water, which will cool them slower. But that can be a little problematic. If they have more money, then they, they have a high-powered laser that will heat the sample up much faster. And generally, that's preferred. Is that different from how we've done it in the past? I'm trying to get a handle on, on why this attempt has uh, been so successful, at least so far. In a broad sense... That's, that's the process that everyone's using. Now, what types of chemicals the people might be using for their, their antifreeze, that can differ from group to group as they're trying to figure out what works best, what combination works best. There are a couple of, of little tricks that Narita actually implemented. So in the antifreeze itself, I talked about how it, it helps prevent the ice crystals from forming, but she actually added gold nanoparticles into the, the antifreeze. And what that does is when you're thawing the animal after it's frozen, It'll help the animal to um, thaw evenly. 
And if that's a little hard to understand, you know, gold nanoparticles sound a little bit like, you know, it's a, it's a bling operation. Hmm. What those gold nanoparticles actually does, if you think about when you prepare food and when you're camping and, and like a tinfoil dinner, right? You have your potatoes, you have your meat and all of that. You wrap it up in tinfoil, you shove it into the fire pit. That tinfoil will help distribute that, e- that heat evenly across your food so that, that all of that heats evenly. That's essentially what the gold nanoparticles are doing for the coral that she's, she's freezing. And so what physically happens to the coral as it's thawed and, and afterwards? Like, what are groups watching for? What does it look like when it, when it succeeds? Yeah, so it depends on the material you're using. Some people might try freezing eggs and sperm. With that, you have the, the complication of you actually have to try to fertilize the egg with the sperm and hope that both the egg and the sperm made it through the, the crop preservation process. So that's, that's a little tricky that some people are working on. But Narita's group, is working on the larvae itself. So when she she has the larvae, before she even freezes it, she checks to make sure it's swimming. And that's kind of a general indicator of this looks like a healthy larvae. And it's already healthy. We're not starting with something that's sick. Right. She'll go through that cryopreservation with the antifreeze, the freezing, and the thawing. And then once the larvae is thawed, um, she'll check to see if it's swimming again. If it is swimming, then she'll she'll observe it for a day or two. And within a day or two, if it's healthy, It'll settle in the dish that she has. And so that just means that it'll stop swimming, it'll settle, and then it'll start transitioning into its its next part in the life cycle. Yeah, explain how that works and and where we ultimately want this to go. So the larvae itself, it basically just looks like a little swimming dot. (laughs) they're, They're kind of cute when you see them swimming around, but there's not a whole lot to see there. When they swim, they're like rod shaped. They'll settle, they'll kind of settle into this round ball and then as they begin transitioning from larvae to, to, you know, juvenile to adult, they'll form that ball and they'll start forming that hard skeleton that I mentioned earlier. And then basically they'll just grow from there. Um, and eventually they'll reach a certain size. They're considered adults. And if they're, they're healthy, then they'll, they'll start producing their own offspring. That's not where we're at yet, though. That's where we're going. That's not where we're at yet, right? So what Narita did is she managed to get her coral to grow up to what's considered an adult size. Now, there are a couple of limitations there, but I mean, the big breakthrough is they've survived longer than anyone else has been able to get them to survive. Hmm. Now, she still hasn't been able to get them to produce offspring, so that would be one of the next steps. You know, that survival rate is still kind of low. You know, 11% compared to the wild is high, but in terms of like, feasible conservation thing, you're losing nine out of 10 of your larvae. That, that's quite low. Right. And so those are kind of two big steps that would have to happen for, for this technology to, to get to the point where we could say, yes, this is a, a viable one-stop shop for conservation. If that happens, and you know, I realize it, it might not happen uh, just yet, but is the goal then to just go to places where the coral once were and and reintroduce them to the wild? Or I guess the conditions in the oceans now uh, such that they might not survive because that's what killed the original coral? Yeah. So, I mean, those are two excellent questions. So I think of it a little bit like this. So I'm, I'm going to go off on a little tangent here, but I'll, I'll get to the questions you asked there. So I think of it like if if say you had an illness or a sickness or you got into a car accident and you needed an organ transplant, we have that technology and that technology will save your life. And we're really grateful for that technology when it's working. But really the the best case scenario is to prevent the, the sickness or the accident if you're able to. And then if you were to expand that out to the human race as a whole, organ transplants aren't going to be enough to save the human race, um, no matter however you, you, you slice that. Mm. And I, I kind of picture this coral cryopreservation in a similar light. It's a very useful tool that can be helpful in helping sick corals kind of get over that hurdle or that hump. Um, but it's not going to be an end-all way of, of preserving or conserving corals, in my opinion. I think most people would probably agree with that. So the, the end goal here is while we're developing this technology, if we get to a point where we lose corals, the end goal here is we will still have the material that if we can ever rectify that to a point where the oceans are healthy for for new corals, then we have that material. It's not lost, kind of like a Noah's art. Right. Or, you know, say you have a sick uh, coral reef, you could do some transplanting things to help try and, and supplement that, but then you would want a healthy coral 
that you were transplanting. You wouldn't want to transplant a sick coral the same way you wouldn't want to, to have a sick organ go to someone else who's already sick. So uh, to that end, Narita's advisor, Justin Lin, he, when I was talking to him, he was talking about how he's trying to develop these coral hospitals where you could, you could either take a sick coral from, from the ocean and bring it into the hospital or say these corals that are recovering from the stress of cryopreservation you have these hospitals set up where you have like these, these ICUs where um, you can take care, nurse these corals back to health, help them get to a point where they're healthy, move them through different wards until they're, they get to the point where they're, they're now healthy enough to be transplanted back either onto the reef where they were or to restore a, a place where there's no longer a reef. What are the broader implications, lastly, of this technology for preservation or uh, reclamation or just increasing the diversity of biology or protecting the diversity that we have? So I, I don't have the statistics pulled up here in front of me, and I, I guess I could do a little digging, but I don't think it's necessary because it's pretty well known that biodiversity across the globe is, is decreasing, mm -hmm. and, and that's problematic. Because uh, generally, the more biodiverse an ecosystem is, that's, that's one of the main measures of how healthy that ecosystem is. And so cryopreservation then offers a tool to um, preserve genetic material that, that is that biodiversity to the point where hopefully, as, as the technology continues to get better, it could be used in a way to restore that biodiversity and therefore restore ecosystems maybe not, not necessarily to their previous health, but to, to help them recover. We just have to hold up our end of the bargain and not let them get worse while these things are frozen. I mean, I think that would be the, the optimal thing. Like I said, I mean, preventing the, the sickness and the illness and the unhealthy ecosystem, that, that's always a better option if you can. But uh, we have a tool now. It's looking promising. Everyone I've talked to, no one has rose-colored glasses, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone is always quick to say there's so much more that needs to be done before this can be like a viable tool. But at the same time, everyone I've talked to has been super excited about, about these kind of incremental breakthroughs. It's been slow. It's been a little agonizing. It's been stressful, I'm sure, for the people who are doing this. But everyone is excited with each incremental change. And that's just how science works, right? You, mm -hmm. you have one breakthrough at a time. And Sometimes they might seem awfully small from one person's perspective, but for the person who's been working on it for 20 or 30 years, it can be huge. So everyone's pointing out, you know, we have a lot of work to do, but um, this is exciting. And it's fun to, to see that excitement and see them talk about it. Brent, thank you so much for this. Thank you. Brent Foster writing in Hakai Magazine. That was Good News Week here on The Big Story. I hope you had as much fun listening as we did making it. I hope you feel a little bit better about the state of the world as you head into your holidays and take a break and come back refreshed, ready for more bad news in the new year. We can always hope not. I'm just mentally preparing you. You can find The Big Story, as always, on Twitter at TheBigStoryFPN if you want to tell us what you thought of this week or any other week. You can hit us up via email at hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca or just call us and leave a voicemail, 416-935-5935. Joseph Fish is the lead producer of The Big Story. Robin Simon is also a producer on the show. Stephanie Phillips is our showrunner. Mary Jubrin is our digital editor. Diana Kay is our manager of business development. Sound design for The Big Story is handled by a whole crew of talented folks. Ryan Clark, Mark Angley, Robin Edgar, Christian Proholm, and many others who step in from time to time. We appreciate every one of them. And most of all, we appreciate you for listening to this show and putting up with us and making this show a success as it heads into what will be its sixth year next year. And I cannot believe that either. I'm your host and executive producer, Jordan Heath-Rawlings. Thank you so much for listening in 2024. We have a few treats, our favorite episodes in the feed for you next week. And as I mentioned, we'll be back with fresh episodes starting January 2nd. We'll talk then.